Hi folks, Chris Mask from Eastlink Community TV's Off the Chip Wagon, food sport competitor, general foodie who likes pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. Uh, the Greater Sudbury Public Library Services has asked me to do a few of these cooking demo videos for you, so here we are in the fall. What's available to us here in Northern Ontario? Wild game. So if you are a carnivore, an omnivore, a hunter, this is your season to shine, really. When it comes to wild game, there's all sorts out there. And when you look around the world, wide game, that's a pretty big umbrella. And it would cover some more exotic meats out there, like alligator and crocodile, um, things like squirrel, raccoon, beaver. We're going to stick to some of the more traditional stuff, which might be a little bit more readily available to you, whether you're going to go and forage it and harvest it for yourself, or you get gifted it by friends and family members. Tis the season for it, right? So we're going to focus in this video on venison, moose, and bear. So when it comes to wild game, let's face it, when you look at ancient cave paintings from, you know, Neanderthal man, uh, there's no salad in those cave paintings. It's meat. So how do you embrace the world of wild game, particularly if, you know, you've never been exposed to it or you've had a really bad experience? Because let's face it, there's a lot of bad experiences out there. It really comes down to knowing your cuts of meat. For example, the big difference between wild game and beef is something called marbling. And in most beef, you're going to get that white fat that goes through it. But in this little piece of moose here, as you can see, there's really not a whole lot of fat. So fat equals flavor, acid, salt, fat, heat. Those are the general components that we need when, you know, you want to create a dish. So where do we get fat from? Well, when you're cooking wild game, introduce it. Whether it's from pork. This is actually some salt pork, which we're going to put into a couple dishes. Uh, bacon, you can use uh, butter if you really want. Really, tallow, any kind of fat works. It's just about knowing now the proper cooking techniques for it. So here's where being a butcher really comes in handy, or at least getting friendly with one, because then you'll get to know your different cuts of meat out there. Now this one right here, this moose, this is an inside round. Now this one here in the corner, this is a backstrap. So this is like your filet mignon here. And this one right here, this is super tender. So things like backstrap, you want fast, high heat. Things like the inside round, bit of a tougher cut, more connective tissue, low and slow. Little TLC goes a whole long way. And even something like this with the bear, which again can be kind of on the tough side, grind it up, turn it into hamburger. That's what we're going to do, in fact, when we make some bear stuffed peppers. And uh, yeah, we're going to go off the rails here on a couple of these uh, recipes here. Common mistakes. People treat wild game like beef, and you can't because of the fact, again, that marbling. And it also comes down to even when you're cooking things like uh, duck or goose or partridge, you know, grouse. You can't cook it like a normal conventional chicken just because it's not the same. And when you get some of those birds, when I talk about uh, fattiness, you know, goose and duck, incredibly fatty, gotta know how to cook it as well. If you cook the meat right though, you're gonna let that flavor shine. So don't bury the taste. Season very lightly. Don't use salt because that's just gonna pull more moisture out of the meat and give you a better chance of overcooking it. And probably the best piece of advice that I can give you, meat thermometer, yeah about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That is what you're looking for. That's basically gonna put you around the rare to the medium rare. And that's how most of these wild game meats need to be served, particularly the hot and fast ones, things like duck. The rest, well, you can push that obviously for health and safety reasons. Uh, public health, I mean, wants all your poultry around about 160, 165. But again, this is your personal preference of things. So be safe when you're cooking your meat. Don't eat it raw. There's, I mean, there are some risks associated with it, depending on, uh, you know, how the meat was harvested, how it was kept and stored and whatnot. But if you're safe, I'm telling you, this is a great experience. You can dip your toes into the market just by going into your local market, whether it's a butcher shop or a grocery store. More and more stores are actually having a much wider variety of wild game and wild meats. In fact, dip your toe in the water. Instead of beef one night, try bison burgers. Or instead of chicken, go for the Cornish game hen, like a little mini chicken. But uh, don't cook your poultry, or your birds whole. You know, do the spatchcock method, cut them up, bone them. It uh, makes for a better 
cook throughout the entire bird. Because a lot of times with the smaller birds there, you're going to dry out a lot of the peripheral meat and that's not good. And again, the leanness. So wrapping things like your partridge breast in bacon, fantastic. Or with those birds like goose and duck that have that more, you know, that higher fat content, particularly in the skin, score the skin to get that super crispy and leave the skin on when you're cooking. There's a completely different taste between grilling a duck breast versus, you know, braising it or turning it into duck confit. A couple other things that you want to keep in mind, waste not, want not, because we all have it. It's a dirty secret in our homes. The forgotten. Whatever meat this happened to be, easy to throw it out, easy to use it as bait. But if you take all that freezer burnt meat, put it into a big old stock pot, let it go for a day, you're going to have broth for days and days and days. And then when you make that stock out of it, I mean, you can use that for gravies. You can use that to uh, keep you warm on a nice cold day. Stews, great addition to it as well. Completely versatile and again, you're not wasting anything. The other thing you can do is take a look at organ meats. Liver, for example, grind that up, make it into pate. You can sit there and uh, add it to your shepherd's pie. You can add it to your tortillera. Add it to your meatballs. Why throw it out when you can repurpose it, right? And then there's some of the more off-cut meat, shall we say, like the heart and the tongue, both of which, if cooked and prepared properly, make delicious tacos. So where there's a stomach, there's a way to figure out how to eat something. But don't mask the flavor. Don't bury it in seasoning. Let the flavors of the wild game speak for themselves. If you'd like to make sure that you don't dry out some of those tougher cuts, uh, one thing you can do is you can marinate your meat. You can brine your meat. I'm a big fan of brining turkeys, in fact, around the Thanksgiving time. It's just a way to add a little bit of moisture into the meat and add a little bit of flavor as well. Something else that you want to keep in mind is uh, whatever you're going to end up serving with your wild game dinner, make sure it complements it. And the old adage is, if it grows together, it goes together. So if we're dealing with wild meat, take a look at uh, where this was harvested from, the time of the season, whether it's the fall vegetables, Things like blueberries, different syrups, be it maple or birch, berries, mushrooms, whatever. If it grows together, it goes together. That meat thermometer, that's where your friend is here because again, we want 140, basically Fahrenheit internal temperature, rare to medium rare for most of your meats. And if you don't like your meat that rare, then obviously go the braising method. So we'll take a look at a couple different ways to cook meat and we're gonna start with yogi. All right, so let's start off with bear. Now this is actually one of the fattier meats and because of it, even though it's got the dark color, like the venison and the moose, you're not gonna wanna treat this like beef. You're gonna treat this more like pork. So it will get a higher internal cooking temperature. 160, I believe Fahrenheit is the safe cooking temperature for bear. But you'll see that it does have, again, like I said, the fat content to it which means we need that longer cooking time more times than not to really break this down. So this is good for turning into burgers, sausage, or today we're gonna end up making a stuffed pepper with uh, some Manitoulin wild rice. And uh, of all strange things, we're gonna do some pickled blueberries. And because I just feel like being out there, blue cheese. Now the blue cheese is kind of the weird thing here, but I'm telling you it complements things beautifully. The nice thing is, is that whatever size of pepper you decide to use, whether you're going for the conventional size or if you'd like to do a little appetizer, stuffed peppers, you just put them in the oven, set it and forget it. It's great for freezing as well. If you'd like to use that as, uh, you know, like a ready-made meal for the future, you want to bring it out to the hunt camp with you, whatever. It's just all about knowing your meat and how to prepare that meat. So there's really not too much to the assembly of this. So you're gonna cut a pepper in half. We're gonna stuff it in with our meat once we send it through the grinder. And to make sure that we do get enough fat content to it, that's where our salt pork is gonna come into play. Plus that's gonna also add to the flavor without actually taking away from the flavor of the bear. Throw it through only about maybe once, twice at the most with a, uh, with basically a dye that's going to give you more of a, a coarse grind. You don't want to like liquefy it 
like you would in a food processor and you don't want to pass it through three times like you would if you would be making sausage. So one, two times at the most. Make sure that you grind it in with that salt pork or the bacon. Then we're going to mix it up with the rice, a couple herbs and spices, stuff our peppers, bake it, 375. We want that internal temperature of 160, but basically with stuffed peppers, you can get away with just blind baking it usually for about 25, 35 minutes. And then we'll top it with our extras there, which I'll show you how to make. And again, the recipe will be included to find out how to turn these into pickled blueberries. So for our cut of venison here, this is, like I said, this is like a prime cut here. The back strap, the filet mignon, if you will, of it all. So we're going to want high heat on this. And we don't want to bury the flavors. We want to complement the flavors. So we're going to do that for this particular cut here by searing this once we coated in these, which are dehydrated wild mushrooms. And I mean, I've got some morels here. There's lobster mushroom and I got some matsutake somewhere in this bowl as well like that if it grows together it goes together so we're going to process that through a food processor and we're going to make basically an exterior spice rub coat that up we want a pan nice high heat put a little bit of our salt pork in there as well with some garlic a little bit of fresh thyme baste it make sure that we have our little meat thermometer with us because we want this internal temperature at what for this, about 140 Fahrenheit. Again, full recipe, I'm going to include that for you to uh, muddle through yourself. But at the end of the day, I'll show you the cooking technique on this. It's really easy and it's not as difficult as you think. But this is a way to really get some big, bold flavors and even get that little bit of uh, umami, as they like to say, into your dish with wild game while allowing the actual taste of the venison still to come through and shine, because I mean, you want this to be the staple of your dish, right? We'll serve this on a nice little bed of some pureed corn, maybe some maple carrots to go along with it. Simple, easy dinner. So finally, our mousse. Now again, not a lot of fat in this, and this particular cup, because it's inside round, we are going to be looking to cook this low and slow. And really, there's different recipes out there. There's different techniques. Probably the one that everybody is used to is the old crock pot with a can of cream of mushroom soup, right? Yeah. Throw in some onion soup there and you're rocking and rolling with uh, basically a very standardized way to cook mousse. But we're going to do things just a little differently with this. The nice thing is when we're dealing with low and slow these days is that whether you're going to use an oven a slow cooker, you always have another option with the pressure cooker or the big fat, of course, the instant pots, which are out there, because that cuts your cooking time down significantly. But you still want to make sure that we lock in as much of the juices that we can into this meat, even though it's going to be cooking basically in a liquid for a couple hours. We still want to seal in things because that's also going to seal in flavor. So I'll show you the technique to prepare this as we get this ready for basically a couple hours in the old crock pot. But uh, don't just do the standard, you know, can of cream of mushroom soup there. Think outside the box a little bit. A little bit of beer or whiskey as your uh, braising fluid for this. Or if, again, from the forgotten, you've got that stock and broth handy, use that. But we'll serve this on some creamy mashed potatoes and it's a good, hearty, warm your belly kind of meal for those cold winter days. So we're gonna start with the pickled blueberries. So really, all you need is a pot, and we're gonna use a small pan here because I'm not really making a big batch of this. But just pre-prep everything, and I mean, this is easy as pie. The longest thing that's gonna happen with this particular recipe is that you're gonna have to let it cool. So if you can get the Northern Ontario wild blueberries, fantastic. Basically, we're looking at a one to two ratio of water versus the two ratio of apple cider vinegar. And we wanna warm this up in the pan. And while that's happening, we can add in our bay leaf and some fresh thyme. Hopefully you have this from your garden, and if not, well, you can pick that up at the grocery store or use the dry stuff. Really, it all works. Another thing you're gonna want is you're gonna to wanna to get your hands on some ginger. So just mince that up Throw that right in there. 
We want a little pepper to go along with this, so we could use black pepper, could use peppercorns, but I'm actually gonna use a blueberry hot sauce. Just enhances the blueberry flavor, gives us a little tiny bit of heat, but we don't want too much heat. Remember, this is uh, something that's basically just gonna give us that little bit of acidity that's gonna go along with our dish because we're serving this with the bear and the blue cheese. So there you go. And finally, blueberries. And I mean, you're gonna use what you have if you've got some left over from the summer and you're picking exploits, good on you. And if not, just buy the stuff in the store. So we're just gonna to wanna to heat this up once it gets to temperature. That's where we can start adding things like salt. So you just want a little pinch of salt. Because again, it's pickling, right? And the last thing to add is uh, just a little bit of honey or a little bit of sugar. Because I'm so well prepped. Again, small batch. Full recipe will be included in this at the end. We're gonna let everything get happy, meld together with the flavors, and I mean, basically just set it aside. Now, the nice thing is with the pickled blueberries is you can actually put these in your fridge and they'll keep for a month, two, three months, just keep them in an airtight jar, a good mason jar, and you know, you're golden with that. We just want to heat this up. We don't want to cook the berries and turn this into a jam, so you can see how now we're getting some activity there with the apple cider vinegar and the water. That's good enough for me. So we can take this off the heat. We're gonna transfer it into my Nemesis, the little Pyrex measuring cup. And we're just gonna set that aside and move on to our next thing. Mashed potatoes. So the concept with mashed potatoes is pick the right potato for the right job. Yukon Gold, ideally that's what you'd like, but if all you have are white potatoes, so be it. The thing is, is coming up with the right consistency because you do not want your mashed potatoes to be gluey and sticky and dense. You want to keep them light. So to do that, we have to introduce some kind of fat to this. So when it comes to adding fat to mashed potatoes, everybody thinks everything goes better with butter. Now, there are others who will tell you that no, no, sour cream, that's the sweet spot. And then there's, well, Snoop Dogg. Yes, the rapper. Snoop D-O-double-G. He released a cookbook. And in that cookbook, his mashed potato recipe calls for mayonnaise. And I laughed at that. And I said, there's no way that's going to taste good. I am a convert, folks. I am telling you, without a shadow of a doubt, However, he came up with this concept, be it the gin or the juice or a combination of the two. Adding mayonnaise to your mashed potatoes makes them super creamy. Not really good if you're watching your calorie count, but hey, it's mashed potatoes. Think of it next time you do a family dinner. And yes, you can use vegan aise as well if you don't want to use the traditional mayonnaise for this. So it's about balancing everything. So for this amount of potatoes that I have here, just because again, we're going small batch here, pretty much about a half a cup will do what you need it to do. And just to make sure that I've got that consistency I want as well, I'm going to add a little bit of vegetable stock to go along with that. Get your potato masher and basically just start working out your frustrations. Whether it's high gas prices, how things are going at work, whatever. Work them up. Kind of therapeutic to do mashed potatoes, really. So you can put this into something like your KitchenAid and uh, let that do the work for you as well because it'll aerate your potatoes. But I actually prefer doing it by hand just because, well, one, I can watch my consistency a little bit better. And two, I don't overwork my potatoes to the point where they're starting to get gluey. So this is a pretty good consistency right now for a starting point here. We got to flavor it though. So here's where we add our salt. And we add whatever else we want. A little bit of pepper. You can use white pepper for this as well. Garlic powder, onion powder. But we don't want the potatoes to be the star of this particular dish, right? We want our mousse to be the star of this dish. So just finish her off like that. 
Make sure you taste. And adjust your seasoning. But I'm telling you, mayonnaise in your mashed potatoes, Snoop Dogg's on to something here. Probably wasn't just whatever he was using for medicinal purpose or recreational purposes either. Try it. I'll have the recipe for you as well. So corn puree. Really, the name is pretty self-explanatory. You're going to take some corn, you're going to puree it. So for the actual recipe, you're going to want about four cobs of corn, but you can use the frozen corn, canned corn, whatever's happy. But the trick is to get a good flavor to it, roast it. Boil it, take it right off the cob, if you did get corn on the cob, and uh, throw it under the broiler just to get a little caramelization Then it really brings out the flavor. Now, there's another secret to this, which is here, almond milk. I'm telling you, game changer when it comes to making purees. So almond milk, roast the corn, and now we'll assemble it. So you're going to want to obviously have something uh, ahead of time prepped, which is either your blender, one of those little things, or the old immersion blender, right? Put the attachment on there, let that run. So get your pan nice and hot, and then you can take your butter, and remember, everything's better with butter. You could use oil if that's your thing. Get that going. Time. Take it off. This way you're not getting the little stalks in there, but you're getting all your, your flavor of the thyme. Thyme is one of those herbs that really enhances the flavor of vegetables. So that's ideal. So we don't want our butter to brown, though brown butter is really tasty. But it's ready, it's hot, and now veggies. So this is not a full mirepoix. But you can see we've got some garlic, we've got some shallots, and just a little bit of celery in there. Now, if we wanted this to be a mirepoix, we'd add our pepper or we'd add our carrots to it, but we don't need it for that. So you can see just in a matter of minutes, on that medium temperature, we're starting to get some color here on the onions. Things are sweating down. So we don't want it to burn. Throw in our corn. Boom. Just like that. You want to add some vegetable stock to it. And again, we're using a small batch here, so this is much smaller. Full recipe will be included at the end of this. And our almond milk. Things happen. What can I do? All right. To give us a little bit of zing to this, uh, you can use cayenne pepper, but I actually like to use ancho chili powder. Consider me like Bobby Flay for this. Just a tiny little dash of paprika to go along with that. And then of course, we want our salt. And you'll eyeball it, you'll figure out what you want for taste. And you can adjust it. That's the beautiful thing about doing this in the blender is that you're gonna be able to season as you go along. So once we mix this all up here, and this gets all happy, We can take it and let it cool a little bit before we transfer it into our blender. Puree this up, and this will be the corn puree that's going to go along with our venison. Remember, if it grows together, it goes together. In this case, I guess if it eats it, might as well eat it with it, right? For the stuffed peppers, I didn't take video of it because there's really not much to see. When I talk about using the right tool when it comes to grinding your meat and the right dye, don't use the smaller ones like this use it a little bit bigger just gives you a, again more texture to the meat and it doesn't turn it into more of like a slurry like if you were making like sausage or a baudet or whatever um so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the back strap so the back strap like i said we don't want to over season it but we do want to cover it in this nice little mushroom dust that we've made so I've taken those dehydrated mushrooms the morels the lobster mushrooms the chanterelles the matsutake and I've basically just through a through food, food processor. <laughs> I've turned it into dust. But one of the other things that I've added to this is uh, Worcestershire powder, because I find it gives it a really nice, deep umami kind of flavor to it. We don't have to go heavy with like salt or pepper. We don't even really want to salt this till the end, but we want to make sure that we have something that's going to complement the meat. So we're going to basically rub that entirely, get it nice and covered and throw it into this nice screaming hot pan, 
to which then eventually we'll add some butter, some thyme, and a little bit of garlic to go along with that. Now remember, we do have a friend we got to bring to this party, right? Meat thermometer. 140, that's what we want. So, here we go. And again, it doesn't have to be pretty how you coat it, but just get a nice coating on it. Those mushrooms really are going to give it a deeper flavor, which is uh, a nice surprise for a lot of people. And the other thing that it's going to do is that regardless of how long it basically takes to brown the exterior of the skin, getting that Maillard effect, right? The flesh, shouldn't say skin. Uh, it's going to give it a nice color. So here we go. That's nice and hot. Should sizzle as soon as we put it down. So again, small meat. Small meat, high heat. Now, when we're cooking this, use your tongs, but if the meat is sticking, don't flip it. It's not ready to go anywhere yet. If you're using a good pan like this one here, we can put this in the oven, we can finish it off, but remember, the ideal temperature you want, 140 on your meat thermometer. The thing is, is with that mushroom crust that we basically made here, it's going to help lock in those juices and it's going to also give us, again, that really deep flavor. So from here, we're going to add our butter in here. There's our garlic. A couple of sprigs of thyme. Add a little more butter to this, just because everything's better with butter and start basting, basically. Don't burn your butter. If you burn your butter and your garlic, things are going to get really bitter tasting really fast. But if you baste your meat like this, this is going to make sure that we've introduced that all-important fat to a very lean cut of meat. And we're going to ensure the proper cooking right through. When you think you've got it, or at least close to where you want it, use your meat thermometer. And check for 140. It already smells fantastic in here with this. Last but not least, let's deal with the round steak. Now remember, this is a low and slow cut. So I talked about marinating and brining, and that's actually what I did last night and the key here is going to be to get a good sear on the outside again not my artifact right but we want to pat dry the exterior of this steak so we don't have that extra moisture in there so this way the meat doesn't go gray we're going to get some good color and yeah it's going to be embracing liquid but we still want to make sure that we kind of keep the consistency and give you a little bit of texture when you're making it so we have a screaming hot pan here and again this is going to be completely fast fry so you got to be ready for this we're going to transfer it over into this where you can see I've got my onions, I've got some uh, mushrooms, some cremini it is, uh, bay leaf, a little bit of soy sauce. We're going to finish this off with a little bit of Worcestershire sauce as well. If you can spell it, you get uh, extra points. And then some hot sauce just because that's the way I roll. And then the rest of the braising liquid, that's going to basically... It's gonna be made up of beer and stock. So we got a good pan here. Let's take our cut. We don't wanna crowd the pan. You can hear the sizzle. And this will go just for a couple minutes. Quick flip. Then in here, cover it up into the oven. But again, you don't necessarily just have to use the oven for this, right? We've got instant pots. We've got pressure cookers. We've got slow cooker crock pots. I mean, this is one of these like all day family heritage labor of love recipes, but you just gotta make it your own. That's why I throw beer in mine. So again, if it sticks, it doesn't wanna go yet. The nice thing these days with things like Instant Pots is that it's a fraction of the time to do these long, normally like, you know, all day recipes. 
where the slow cooker takes 16 hours, an instant pot can take as little as 40 minutes. Basically, it's a, it's a pressure cooker, more or less. And you can use a conventional pressure cooker for this as well. But there's something to be said about just letting it go all day and really develop those deep, rich flavors. Because at the end of the day, you want to make this mousse taste like mousse. But you also want to make it a taste experience somebody is not going to forget. And that's the reason why, again, a little labor of love into this, and don't salt it before it goes in the pan. While we marinate or brine it, we're not salting that exterior and pulling that extra moisture out of it. Pressure cooker, I mean, yeah, it's going to cook in moisture, but at the end of the day, you want to have that, you want to have an experience that people are going to remember and not say, oh, I don't like mousse because I, uh, I had this person make it. I'm telling you, if it is prepared right, it's hard to say that you really don't like a food out there. You can see how we're getting that crust here on the exterior. That's exactly what we want. We'll get that on side number two and throw it in here with our braising liquid. So there you go. We've got our crust on both sides. As long as it doesn't stick in the pan, which it doesn't, that means it's ready for our braising liquid. So again, pressure cooker, instant pot, whatever. Just make sure you have enough fluid to cover the meat. So here is a bit of beer, and this is a whole lot of stock. And I like using just vegetable stock for this, but I mean, if you want to use beef stock, you can, or if you've used the castaways, remember the castaways? Yeah, use your own wild game stock with this. Basically, let's just cover the meat enough to say it's covered. Let me do some adjustments here. And then we'll cover it up, stick it in the oven, and come back in a few hours. It's a nice thing. I can go and run errands while I'm doing this and also clean the kitchen. All right, several hours and a couple of scrubby sponges later, final product. So let's start with just a quick recap here. Know your cut of meat, know what you want to do with it, how to prepare it, don't salt it. Internal temperatures, incredibly important. You can get away with venison and moose at about 140, but bear, treat it more like pork. So get a little closer to 160. Don't cook your birds whole if you're going to be doing that. And while we don't have any kind of fowl involved with this, all we have is deliciousness, like this mousse. Now we're talking about a slow braise, you can see we've got the color on the outside, Huntsman gravy to go along with that, our mayonnaise and our mashed potatoes, there's some mushrooms and onions in this. And again, we're talking something that is literally fork tender, as you want it to be. A ton of flavor, perfect comfort food. You could tell people that this is beef, and they'd probably believe you. Bear, a little more out there. We took our peppers, we stuffed it with the wild black Manitoulin rice. We got the uh, bear that we ground up with the salt pork, so we want a coarse chuck with that. Blue cheese, pickled blueberries on top of this one. So that gives you, again, a little bit of uh, acidity to go with this. And yeah, I know the rice. You say, ooh, the rice is burnt. No, it's not burnt, it's black rice. And once you actually get all of this together on one bite, the blueberry, the blue cheese, the pepper, oh man. It's just a huge flavor bomb in your mouth. I mean, you wanna talk about umami. That's it right there, folks. The acidity from those blueberries, acid, salt, fat, heat, those four things you want in any dish you make to make sure that it's nice, uniform, and cohesive. Now, backstrap. This is the one that's fast. So the mousse, low and slow. The venison backstrap, again, treat it like filet mignon here. And internal temperature is everything. Finished it off with a cranberry barbecue sauce, a bit of whiskey in there too. Uh, that is a corn puree, and we've got some birch syrup glazed carrots, which I actually took out of my garden down there. So again, color. People say, oh, that's too rare. But again, this meat is so lean, you really don't want to serve this anything over 140. Bit of a smoked birch salt on top of it too, if you're wondering where the salt came from. But again, get a little bit of everything into one bite. And one big old bite. Ah. 
spectacular. It just melts in your mouth. So, when it comes to wild game, know your cut of meat, temperature, how to prepare it, and just have some fun with it. A little side note with the corn puree, make sure that you do pass it through a sieve, get rid of all the husky stuff there. You could eat that extra fiber in your diet, clean colon is a happy colon, right? <clears throat> and the pickled blueberries, the one ingredient that I didn't mention, which is going to be included in the recipe that goes along with these videos. Uh, try and find some juniper. Now, if you can't find juniper, use gin. But uh, pickled blueberries, trust me, it's a nice little bright pop of acidity on your tongue. Goes with a whole lot of dishes. Hopefully wild game is not so scary for you anymore. And even if you're just dipping your toe into the water, so to speak, with any luck, you're going to find something that's uh, going to float your boat, so to speak. So thanks again for watching. If there's anything that you want to see in the future done in terms of a video, by all means, reach out to me on social media, reach out to the library. They'll get a hold of me. Really not that too hard to find. Until then, bon appetit.